So welcome to um, OSARC's 20th monthly meetup. Turn on the little camera, it's quite cute, there it is. Um, so today we're looking at IFC Connector, which as it says there is for managing and visualizing BIM data. So Fodak will be telling us all about that tool that he's been developing over the last years. His uh, background is in architecture, worked with a couple of firms' uh, names you'd recognize. Um, you mentioned Zaha Hadid and Herzog de Muron, where you were BIM manager. Um, and Foyk has le learned Python programming himself, and got more and more into that as a BIM manager, uh, and been working in AEC since back in 2007. So you've got lots of stuff to tell us, and I will let you just get onto it. Um, and we'll have some questions at the end. Yes, thank you for the introduction. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming and showing up. Let me quickly share my screen. And just a side note, in the chat, I put a link to the um, shared CryptPad where there's the outline of the presentation today and also some links if you want to grab them. Uh, copy pasting is easier from there, I guess. All right. So um, I'm going to show IFC Connector today. This is um, so you might want to ask, okay, what's, what, what is it? It's a I call it very generically a flexible and hackable, simple, um, yeah, IEC data hub. You can really put kind of any data there. That's that's uh, what it makes. Is it strength? I think a strength. I think, um, but it makes it a little hard to describe. It's an open source project. You can find on GitHub. And um, you find some scenarios where I think it might be useful, but I'm, I'm, this list of scenarios is definitely not exhaustive. And uh, there's plenty of more cases where this might, might be useful. If you want to get it up and running, um, we had uh, um, Jakob, a member of the uh, Vienna Revit user group, uh, writing a full detailed installation guide and in the wiki. So if you're in the if you want to have it running, you can even run it on a Raspberry Pi. That's what he did. And here in the wiki, there's, a, there's an installation guide step by step. Um, it is, um, yeah, it has a few components. So we can check it out right now. There's basically, it's running on a, on a Linux server and uh, having a, a, a database, in that case, MongoDB. Um, then it has a, a backend, which is fast API, and then it's it's routed by traffic, but basically this, this thing here is the server, and then several clients can talk to it. And um, these could be any applications like IFC OpenShell, Blender BIM, Revit, uh, Cadver, whatever BIM application you, you know, and um, or, or you can basically make requests to, for example, with Python or other languages. And then there's also the automated uh, API, so you can get directly to the, the functionality of um, uh, IFC Connector. And then there's also the web front end. But these are basically like the web front end is using the, the web API most of the time, but you don't need to look in your browser to see the data. You can also interact with the data from your applications. It's basically, you, you have the choice. All right. Um, yeah, maybe a quick note. There's a in the in the repo. There's a description also of what it not is. So it's not a full blown 3D data hub with 3D uh, and and like amazing stuff like Speckle. Like it's not it's not this like full featured um, uh, big package. It's like more lightweight and um, quick and easy to uh, or yeah, quick and easy to to adjust. Um, Quick and easy in like I wrote uh, configurable as in source code. So you, you, if you if you want to um, adjust your, your data, you definitely have to um, write a few lines. Um, but some some of it is, is very simple as I as I will hopefully be able to show. Right. Um, so there is right. the open source repos. Sorry, is that a question? It's Duncan here. Could you maybe um, increase the the zoom on your browser there? Just ah, one sure. This one? Something like that is much better. Yeah. yeah, yeah, OK, yeah. Thank you. So the, OK, and then here we can probably do the same. Yeah. All right. So that does basically, OK, you can get to the um, uh, nectar. Um, 
so you can get to the new nectar code and i will show uh, a few demos afterwards how it is in progress because i think that's the that's the easiest there's some nice um screenshots maybe on the on the repo but if you see the tool live that's that's probably more convincing and uh, it's better to understand what it's actually doing so i'm gonna do um two demos one is basically the the, the main features uh, connecting to pyravit and then also to showcase okay when we write um stuff from Blender BIM or pull it from other, this data from other connection, I will show that too quickly. Um, all the part that I'm gonna show in PyRevit, all this um, functionality is also open source available in our PyRevit Erna, um, IFC connector scripts uh, in that link. And um, with that, I probably should jump to actually how it, how it looks. So we, I said we had uh, a couple of components. We first are going to look at um, briefly at this part here. This is the, the web API. So this is kind of an automatic documentation of your code. So um, we have certain sections of interaction, like you can um, interact with certain categories like levels, rooms, voids, grids, boxes at the moment, and room types, but this is extendable. You can, can have more of, of these, and each of them have the, the classical five things, uh, get one void, add a void, get a specific void, update a specific void, delete a specific void. It's a typical CRUD operation, so-called um, create, read, update, delete um, operations. So this basically is a um, yeah, maybe a very sober interface, but it's, it's an automatically generated. So that's very nice. I don't have to like write extra code to, to get this um, uh, added. So this is basically wherever your server lives and then slash docs, you will get you will always get this um, automatic um, uh, documentation. There's another one on Redoc if you like that better. This is basically just a different flavor. Um, most of the time, um, one is probably either in the BIM uh, application or in, on the web front end. And I'm gonna start with the web front end here. So um, when you are uh, starting IFC connector. Uh, on the on the main page, which is under uh, web projects info, um, it will list all your projects. I have a few dummy projects here since it's just just on my on my local computer, so that's why you see the local host here. And I created just a new fresh project that we're gonna populate with some um, uh, with some data. Um, a lot of functionality is uh, available directly in the um, in the web uh, interface, but not everything. So um, not everything yet. So for example, um, creating a new project um, is not yet here as a button. You would need to go here and say, okay, I want to I want to add a new button. But there's a, a um, uh, kind of a, a suggestion. What what a typical project would have. So you could go here, try it out and give it a different name. So I did pi project and then hit the execute button and then hopefully you get a, a 200 for uh, a response that says, okay, everything is cool. And then you should get your projects uh, all listed here. As you can see, these different um, projects have different um, uh, categories listed. Uh, so this pi project that we're gonna look at uh, currently has just rooms, levels, and room types, but you will also see this little um, test project, which has uh, um, yeah, rooms, levels, voids, boxes, room types, grids, basically all the um, categories I've implemented at the moment. It's, it's the, the, the test um, project, as, as the name suggests. So if we go into um, a project, um, there's the configuration page where we can get a little, this, oh, hang on a sec. Where we can get, I can also make this bigger. Yeah. Um, where we get a little brief overview of the of the data we we entered, and uh, then also the uh, the categories that are available at the moment. As we see in the main page, there is nothing here. Like this project, this demo project has eighteen rooms, three levels, and two room types. But this one has has nothing because I just created it. Um, then we can switch here to these overviews. Um, and these will, at the moment, show us like just basically empty tables. So if we if we click on the rooms, so we see now, sorry for the browser plugin. 
Um, it's now the a, a, um, a project with just uh, zero room, so that's not very exciting. Um, so let's actually actually populate it. Um, to connect a um, a Revit project to a uh, to your IFC connector, you basically just need to um, enter two things, and this is also documented in the wiki, so you don't need to remember this. So if you're if you're um, going to the uh, to the wiki um, in the project, um, there you there you see how you can can connect um, your uh, um, your Revit um, your Revit uh, to the IFC connector, which I'm going to do right now. So it's um, it's, a, it's also very simple, um, but I just want to point out that it's documented as well. Um, if you go into the manage, then under the project information tab, you will find two parameters that we need. Uh, you can make them project or shared parameters, doesn't matter. Uh, shared parameter is probably nicer. Um, the one is um, DB project name. That is the project name you want to have listed here. Uh, or you also have always in the URLs um, when, you, when you're referring to the project. Um, that is the that is the project name here, and then the other is the basically the server address, um, which says okay to which server it should talk. Um, there's going to be at some point in a PyRevit script that, that helps a little bit this bootstrapping of the two parameters, but right now it's just having these two parameters and then enter and and then and then um, yeah have have to uh, have them entered here. Um, and now that we have this. Um, this basically connected, so you just need these two parameter values. Then you can basically go to your um, your PyRabbit script. So you can just um, uh, copy, if you like, um, from the IFC connector. This is the IFC connector now from the PyRabbit Erna, which are open source uh, under the link you can find in the uh, in the script pad. And um, these are basically just Python scripts that um, to, that do pull and push of, of certain data. So for example, you can send your levels, your room data. If you just push your rooms, then it will tell us, okay, uh, yeah, there's no levels yet to attach the rooms to. So it's a good idea to actually send the levels first. And let's see if the demo gods are with us. <laughs> so it's first gonna check if, if a such named project actually exists on the server. And um, that it, it would now compl it would complain here if, if it wouldn't find that project. So it obviously found that. And then it's gonna check um, the levels for mismatches. Are there, are there currently it's um, I think it's currently just names, but it's looking okay. How many levels do I have? What name do I have? And uh, since it didn't find anything on the server, so in the DB there's nothing. And here he has level one, two, three. He said like, okay, I go ahead and try to send these levels. And um, whenever you see a 200 status in uh, web development, that is a, that is a okay. So it, it worked. So now we should um, see some content. So if I refresh this page, we will see these um, three uh, levels. And we can look at our first um, uh, grid view of the, um, of the, uh, of just the levels in the, of the project. Note that what is available here in the web interface is also available in the automatic um, documentation. So if I were to go into API levels and say, okay, show me all the levels here, I would just need to say, okay, I want to try out and I want to, I'm going to mention the Pi project and say execute. Then here you get uh, a JSON uh, text representation of the information it has on all the levels. So these are the ones that I just sent from from Revit, and as you see, and you see, as you see um, it just sends the the IFC GID, the the actual elevation, and uh, the name. So it's a very tiny data set. You can uh, extend this, as I will show also later in the rooms. But um, the idea is basically uh, for many tasks, I need a very small and simple um, data set. Um, so and then in the so, so I, I, I'm not sending everything to the server, just just the thing I need there or the thing I need uh, from other applications. Okay, now that we have our levels here, it would be nice to also get the get the rooms going. So we switch back to Revit, and then we say, I see connector, um, push room data. 
So this will go now through the rooms that you see listed down here in the um, uh, in, in the schedule. And um, there's some parameters it, it will not find, but this is, this is okay. Um, it started already sending the rooms. Um, so we see this, uh, the, the GIDs and the, um, the status web status code. So they, they're all coming in fine. Right now, of course, I'm not running against a, a server somewhere in the, in the internet, but um, uh, this is just uh, a local server. So I can see here in real time how the, the um, room data comes in. All right, and I said, okay, we have the we have the data there, so we should see also now our rooms listed. So if we go to our rooms, we again we see these uh, list type um, uh, of overview of all the the data we we uh, we put there. Um, and now this is of course a very condensed um, uh, three column schedule, and we can configure what what we want to see there. But let's maybe just first find out what we actually did send. So if we look into the API into rooms and say we want to get all the rooms for the Pi project, um, we see all these rooms here and you see there's quite quite more data on here. So, okay, this level is a nested thing, but still we have the Revit area, we have the long name, uh, Gebäude tile, so this is a custom uh, German added parameter, uh, German named um, uh, added parameter. So there is already more data in the database uh, that we sent from Revit that we can see in this in this table view. So we should um, um, so we should have a look at how can we configure this. Um, whenever you're in these views, you can go here with the link to the um, project configuration, and there you have the um, possibility to um, basically for each category change the uh, um, schedule columns. So let's let's go for the room columns, and um, you can s save the server wide or just for you as a as a user not to annoy others. Um, for now, I'm gonna gonna have a look at the IC GID, the name, long name, description. Uh, we have the border tile was uh, department might be interesting. Then room type maybe later, and then level name is definitely interesting. Maybe the, I want to see the elevation, and then I want to see the, the Revit area. Okay, and then I say okay, I want to save this as um, as user config. And if I um, refresh here, um, then we will have a table with all the um, with all the columns that we just specified. Um, so this is sort of a representation of what we what we see over in Revit as well. Um, so like this, and now we can actually change it on either side and tell the other side uh, to to get the data. There's of course different models how you could uh, think of how it should be um, correct for a certain project. So some project may only have Revit as their single source of truth and want to tell someone else their room data. So then always Revit will push, but it will never pull. Sometimes you might think, okay, for this project, we want to um, use the capabilities of IFC Connector of um, uh, modifying the data. Uh, and then get it back to Revit. So then Revit can push and pull. Um, but this is, of course, something that needs to be decided in the project. And the, the tool is not going to um, uh, decide for you. you the, 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 the task is on you. Um, so once we have this uh, table view, um, we can do like um, probably obvious things that, that which can just um, sort that stuff or filter, of course. So if I want to have uh, only the meeting rooms, for example, we can just filter this, and we can also have this like multi-stage. So if I'm uh, only interested in the 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 um, in certain, um, then it will always apply these filters and steps, and will always tell what are the applied filters. You can of course also reset this. Um, and uh, yeah, that, that should make for a pretty flexible filter. The filtering is not only good for just viewing a smaller subset of your elements, it's also great for editing. While you can, of course, um, hand edit something here 
and you see the the lines get gray if they get edited. Um, well, this this I would not consider very um, yeah uh, efficient because um, that's what I can do in the <laughs> Revit schedule also, and, um, and this is this is an, this is low on by all sides. It's possible, of course, but it's um, yeah, I wouldn't recommend. So I, um, I'm uh, gonna say okay, no, I don't I don't want these changes. Uh, I wanna I'm gonna do a smarter way. So for example, uh, let's say we see these departments here. And um, all the meetings rooms don't seem to have uh, any any department. So let's maybe put them to a department. So if I filter for the for meeting, and you can filter globally as I just did, or you can filter just for certain um, uh, columns if you if you want to have a like a more precise um, way of filtering. Um, then I can say okay. All the things I see, I want to edit them at once. I want to use this multi-edit um, uh, multi tool. Um, and let's say I want to put them all in the same department, uh, meeting rooms, and then apply this. And then I, I now it doesn't matter how many of these I have. I just need to make sure I filter the correct ones. And then I uh, can apply any of these. Um, um, these values also for multiple. So let's say we also um, want to put a description here, uh, meet and greet. I mean, it's all, all, all going to be stupid that I'm going to uh, enter this evening. So bear with me. Um, so we have now data here. And then right now, it's just in our browser. Nothing has changed in the database or in Revit. Um, but if we want this to persist and have this uh, change, we can just say, okay, save it to the server. Now it's uh, saved to the um, um, uh, to the database. So now it's not in Revit yet, but it's on the database. So if you look at our little uh, graph earlier, so now we were looking basically at the web front end and telling uh, this, this, this fast API web app, um, okay, save it to this database. Now we can say from Revit, oh, give, give, me, that, give me that data, I want, I, want, I want this here too. So uh, let's have a look. When we, let's go back to this here. Um, when we're back in Revit, we, let's pull this over. Um, when we look at our, tools, there's not only a push data, but also a, a, a pull data. So let's do that. Uh, blah, 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 pull room data. And add a little contact the server again, and then uh, grab um, the data and write it here. So we see now here's the, here's the meeting rooms. Um, it's also, it, it got the new department and apparently I did not have the description in the schedule. I'll level up. Mm. Ah, let's have a look. So the that's maybe a good point to. So I have only a certain view here and a and another view here. So now you might uh, ask, like, how are these um, parameters connected to each other? Well, the answer is you, that's for you to define. Right now, what's um, predefined in this IFC PyRevit um, connector database that you also can extend at any point uh, is that certain parameters talk to certain other parameters. There's the obvious ones where uh, uh, IFC GID goes to IFC GID. Then there's this um, not so obvious anymore, but uh, happening in many in many places um, that the um, uh, the name uh, in the uh, in most BIM application maps to a number, also the IFC name maps to a number in the in, in Revit uh, here, but also in other applications. And then the long name actually maps to the to the name. And then you can have other um, uh, uh, parameters map to each other. And as you see, there's two directions. There's one where you map data from Revit to the database and from the database to Revit, because uh, that's not always um, a, a clear thing. So for example, in um, the IFC connector, you can define room types, and uh, that is not something Revit actually really does. Uh, there's this, this quirky thing of, uh, of um, uh, key schedules, but that's not really a room type, unfortunately. Um, 
so so there's something that we cannot map there and there's there's other applications that also uh, don't have this room type notion or maybe other things so there's there's um there's always there always need to be to put some thought into how how do i map the data but um when i when i have this this mapping um going i can of course um, do, it the, do it the other way and say ah oh, actually i want to um i want to put this in the uh restrooms in the toilets department and then send that to the um, push room data um, send that to the web end and then um, of course we get the data there so right now this is this is all well and good it is, it's nice to um, like mass edit basically um, um, yeah room parameters uh, or, or parameters of other elements as you can can do the same with, with with the other views. What's um, maybe interesting also is um, all the other categories they have they share this table view, but um, rooms have a kind of a special special place in the IFC connector because that is basically where the um, project um, originated at um, in our in our company. So. Um, we wanted to get a, a nice overview of our rooms and then maybe have single pages per rooms and stuff like that. So uh, I'm gonna quickly refresh, uh, reload latest from server, and then we have our toilets in the toilets department. So um, the data can go either ways so in, in this project as we, as we just defined. So um, I was talking about nice representation of rooms, but we don't see any here. That's because we don't have any outlines for rooms yet. So you see here uh, no items with uh, outline information available for graph. So that means we need to generate it. There's multiple ways how you can basically generate these room outlines here um, and uh, send them over to, uh, to IFC connector. In the case of um, Revit, um, that is one of these um, uh, uh, yeah, PyRevit scripts. So we say push room outlines, and then what it's basically gonna do is gonna um, get the outlines from, uh, from Brevet um, is gonna um, look at their coordinates and basically send those um, on into the into the into the uh, database, and um, we use these to then show the outlines of the rooms and then be able to colorize the rooms by their parameters. This is the way how it works in Revit, but there's other options too. So the actually the first um, place I started was Blender BIM. I um, Blender BIM, or to be more precise, I used uh, IFC Open Shell there. Um, I grabbed the rooms there. They have the BIM convert axi, on, and there you can generate SVG um, outlines for all your rooms and send those with a little script uh, onto your. Um, uh, onto your IFC connector, and that works the same. So it basically just needs SVG paths. So SVG is a, a format how you can um, draw graphics and uh, vector graphics, um, and it's widely used on the web, and that's why it's kind of handy here. Um, so when we hover over these uh, over these rooms, we see there all the data um, in the hover that we before defined for these. Um, um, for these columns and whenever we do any um, filtering so i'm gonna zoom out a little just to see the show the effect better if we say okay we want to only see the meetings then of course the graph filters but also the um, um, also the the table and the graph um, update basically um, so showing these um, Outlines is nice, and they're 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 happy and colorful, and you can zoom in and zoom out. And when you click on one, you basically get a single new page, um, just just showing you one page for that room with the with the data attached to it. But um, uh, the way how we see it here at the moment is not the the only um, uh, way of coloring it because the default coloring is basically it's going always first to the ICGID, so this. This makes it very nice and colorful, but not very meaningful because, yeah, uh, we would only see different colors for different um, IFC GIDs, so that's not very helpful. If you want to change the um, outline 
color by parameters that you have in your table. Um, that's easy. So uh, as you, you just go to this outline graph colors by param, and then you say, for example, okay, a building part, okay, body type. So this is this is a, a, a little boring, but it shows okay, okay. Here we have all the rooms with the body tile Y or the, the building part Y, and then here with the building part P. And then you can do more interesting things, like for example, go to the department. And now you will see we have different rooms with different departments, but we also see all the rooms in gray. And this is one thing that um, IC Connector also can help you help you with um, finding elements that have no data. There's of course multiple ways. So there's a with the visual way, as we see here now, or there's also the filtering way. So if I, um, uh, or the, the, the sorting way, so now I can just uh, sort all the empty ones on the top, or I can also do that with the with the filtering. So let's say I'm interested in all the rooms with, this, with no description in it. I can just make this empty here and say, I want to filter on description. And then I basically see um, only the, only the uh, only the blank ones, and maybe if if that's what I want to change, I can then quickly go to my multi uh, multi edit tool and um, uh, change what's what's needed there. Um, the outline graph is um, not the uh, there's not not all of these parameters make sense. That's that's clear. The ICGID is maybe not interesting. Revit area is also not so not so helpful. Uh, but um, other other things uh, might be actually very useful to color in. But the outline graph is not the only graph we can use here. So the uh, library that is used here is um, uh, Bokeh. It's a, a, a graphing library I used uh, for a long time. Uh, Usually just for bar graphs and, um, uh, and uh, these like statistical visualizations, um, but uh, at some point I found out I can actually also um, visualize these um, SVG paths, um, and then then it became a nice choice for um, uh, visualizing room rooms in the IFC connector. Um, but uh, since it's a general graphic li uh, graph uh, graphing library, uh, it cannot only show SVG paths, um, but also other graphs. Right now, there's another type implemented that is here, over here. Uh, That's a bar graph. So I can say um, I want a bar graph, and maybe I want to see again the uh, uh, let's see, maybe maybe by long name. Uh, Long name. So now I see them graphed. So I have the 10 offices, have, have one restroom, uh, I have three meeting rooms, one lobby, and two corridors. And I see I have no gray bar here. So there's no, um, nothing, no, no um, items, no room items that have no name. So, okay, that, that's kind of nice to see. Um, often the count helps basically for do I have um, ones that have no, um, have no data on it and I want to see the gray bar or how many different ones I have. But uh, a lot of times I want to actually see see them graphed by area and I can do that in, in uh, changing from, from count to area. And now I see how many square meters in this case uh, I have for each of these uh, rooms. Yeah, so that is, I think, a nice overview over the room part. Let me quickly double check. So we did room data editing, sending, receiving outlines, coloring bar graph. Yes. Um, so there's other data we can also send to IFC connector. As we saw earlier, we have these um, uh, all these categories down here, and I will continuously uh, grow them because I, 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 I know already I will need more. Um, as we saw the um, Oh, we actually did not see that. But um, as we saw that the data model is very, very small and very simple. And um, we will we will see that also in the next um, example, where I just went ahead and said, OK, um, I have a certain project. Uh, I actually uh, was hiding the, the stuff that was the actual project and um, uh, just kept the, kept the grid, because that was the thing I was experimenting with. And then with a little Python script, I just um, extracted the um, grip information and send it over to 
um, to the IFC connector to know how this um, data would need to look like that I would need to send. I can go here and check, okay, I want to add items, grid items. And if I go try out and uh, say test, um, I can actually execute what is here suggested. Of course, this is just some dummy suggestion data to give you an, a good idea on um, what you actually need for as input when you want to send something to the server. Um, but that's not the only point. You can also scroll down here. And here you basically have, you can call it like a contract, basically. You have the grid schema, and there it tells you what kind of data points it knows. And um, uh, with, uh, with the red asterisk um, notify, uh, notifying about those that uh, are actually required. So these are required true. I, when, I send, when I send a new grid, I cannot send it without the endpoints and I cannot send it without a name and an IFC at your ID. You can change this at any time. Um, we, have, we can have a brief look actually now. Uh, in the source code um, and IFC connector, you have basically um, uh, the app and then in the app there's the models and the models these define these um, uh, box or grid um, uh, data models and basically what you saw before is just this here I just say okay I have a name I have an ICOGD I have an endpoint and I am saying which ones are required and which ones are not and adding new ones is basically um, uh, as much as that here and ending in down here as well uh, and in the database handler, which I'm gonna factoring out, so hopefully it's not gonna need it in another place. So uh, you basically need a new uh, definition of a category that you that you have, and then you can basically uh, add um, parameter entries that you that you want on your objects. And then you give a little example for the user. This is the one we saw in the web interface. And um, so then people can learn really quickly uh, what data they get and what, they, what data they need to send. Um, so in the case of um, the grids coming from Blender BIM, I put that into the um, test project. So let's have a look at the grids here. So these are the grids here. So as I learned earlier, maybe you saw this in the, in the in the uh, OSR chat, <laughs> I just brief recently found out that uh, grid axes themselves don't have an IFC GID, which I found really sad. Um, only the containing grid container does have an IFC GID, so I have to had to construct one myself. So I basically took the IFC GID of the grid container and just um, put the, uh, the the grid name uh, in, in the back. Um, so that shows um, you can, you don't need to have like uh, actually legal IFC or GIDs here. You just need to have something here. And it's a good idea to have a, a unique something here because otherwise, uh, yeah, it's, uh, you probably get in, get in trouble, but you can put basically any ID here. So if you, for, for example, let's say you're an office using only Revit, you could put your, your Revit UID in here if you, if you really wanted to. If you want to use the IFC GID, which I think is a is a is a better choice, because uh, then interacting uh, with uh, or uh, yeah, uh, working with other disciplines together is uh, um, is nice, because then you uh, get the IFC GID here. Then you probably know when you're exporting um, IFC GIDs, um, it's a it's a I think a great idea to tick the. Um, uh, option that you should store the IFC or GID in the element. And um, that is what we are basically seeing here. Uh, all these rooms have their have their IFC GID from the uh, uh, from, from that export uh, plugin. And then um, they can they can basically talk about the same thing because the IFC GID is kind of a name for the a unique name for, for this element. Uh, a room in this case in Revit or a grid uh, access in this case. So um, as you see, the, the, this here is, is very simple. We have just um, basically um, uh, two points. So I, uh, I start point and an end point for a grid axis, and we have a name. And um, that is basically the, the, the um, simple data model uh, that I need for drawing a grid in, in any other application. I uh, have kind of here a, a slim, minimal 
data model. And then I go to another application. I choose in this case, um, uh, Cutwork to show that it's really, it's, it's not about which, which um, uh, application. It's more about, uh, can you talk to the IFC connector service and uh, that you kind of always can do when you have an API? And then uh, can you hopefully draw your objects? And in the case of um, uh, Cutworks, which is a, yeah, uh, we use it a lot for our wood construction at Anna Holzbau, um, you can use a, a nice C Python uh, API. And uh, we're now gonna, um, talk to IC connector and ask for the grids and let them let them redraw. So let me quickly um, grab that script. Um, can work. Grids, here we go. Um, I'm gonna draw actually uh, I'm going to draw a little more. I'm not only going to draw just the grids, but also the levels and some boxes that I also pull, and we kind of have a look at it later. But uh, we're going to do it all in all in one go. Um, so I paste my script here, let it run, and then it's now talking to the IC connector. It's drawing the grids, uh, creating the levels that are um, invisible, uh, and then it's also um, drawing some boxes that we can have a look at. Um, up here and um, so basically now we have these um, these grids drawn um, exactly from um, this information that was on the IFC connector and as you can imagine this could be from any um, any application so we get our the, the model was not very big so all we can expect is a line correctly drawn with a with a with the proper name and um, we see over here also, since we're building a lot of um, rectangular simple um, uh, modules um, for certain projects, um, we are, uh, of course, very interested to be able to uh, also have a simple box representation, which is almost as simple as the, as the line, as you will see in a bit, because we only store the box minimum and max maximum point, like the bounding box min point and max point, which restricts us to um, currently to uh, orthogonal boxes only. But um, since this is kind of 90, 97% of our use cases, this is this is the model we start with. Um, so let's have a look at the at these boxes. If I recall correctly, I also have them in the test. Yes, it's these six boxes. And so, um, um, maybe I show the, so, um, down box min max, because otherwise it's not gonna telling where these points are. So these are our bounding box min max points, as I, as I said earlier. Um, they look very much like the endpoints of the grids because we also just need, need two points. And um, then an IFC GID, and in this case, a name that uh, if I recall correctly, we are, are trans, we are putting here as well. Let's double check. Oh no, we have still have to do that. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. As you can see, this is this is um, very much work in progress, but um, the, the boxes is the latest addition, basically. But um, yeah, maybe that's a good point to uh, to note that um, yeah, as an open source um, project, if um, other people have ideas what you can do with this as well, like pull requests and discussions at the um, issue board are very welcome. And um, yeah, but also a, a typical note on open source project. Um, yeah, if you can you can use it on, on your site, but if it breaks, you get to keep all the shiny pieces. Um, but um, yeah, what I what I basically like um, is that it is very uh, extendable. So this, this boxes um, I could very quickly add into um, in into IFC connector with without much effort. And I'm currently working on making this even simpler so people can uh, add their own data models as well. Um, 
the yeah maybe one last word before I open for discussion. Um, since I'm my, my main language is Python and I write everything in Python, um, you might wonder okay what what about the web front end like. Um, Usually, uh, there's uh, this is always done in, in JavaScript, but since I don't know any JavaScript, I found a nice project which is called Brython. Uh, big shout out to the to the Brython guys, so Brython.info. Um, they basically wrote a Python interpreter in JavaScript, so I can write all this in Python. So if you know Python, there's no additional language you would need to learn to to hack on on IFC connector. And what's very helpful to me is um, I can always pull a, a debug console here, and I can um, uh, interact with the page directly. So. Um, state, um, let's say, uh, I don't want to see the table, for example, for whatever reason. Um, here I get the table and I can say dot clear. Uh, don't have a clear. Okay, maybe let's say puts, um, uh, we put something there. Uh, and um, just, um, maybe a diff. That's in it. Not so, not so important. But basically, you can um, query all the so yeah, your table, your table data basically. So you can go through the rows and maybe grab the first row. And then uh, mm, let's say cell cells two, and then uh, dot text, and you can basically get to all your data in the front end and can add functionality and, and uh, remove functionality interactively to try things out. But you can also, of course, um, go to the source code, and you will find in the uh, templates. Um, so this is, for example, the generic uh, items table. You will find um, actual Python code in the HTML code, which is um, yeah probably surprising to some folks. Um, but you can write your your Python here, and then uh, this is on the front end. But also, when you're writing code on the back end, you you you, you still have the same. Uh, language all, all over the whole project. So that's maybe a, a little special specialty to to point out. Yeah, and I think that is that is all I wanted to show. And I know I'm very curious on, on QA and discussions. And um, yeah, you can if you if you find something later and uh, or want to contribute to IFC Connector or, or Talk about some issues that you found. Uh, you're very welcome to, to add them to the issue board and the uh, GitHub uh, repo. And uh, you can also just hit me up on the uh, metrics chat. And I think uh, I will switch to uh, QA then. Thank you very much. Thank you, Frederick. I noticed that you had you had some calls or you had some um, created by and when data in the IFC. Is, is there an intention that multiple people would be able to work on that database at the same time? Yeah, at the moment you can't do that already, um, but uh, it's probably a good idea to, to uh, communicate because um, you're basically overwriting um, uh, each other's um, uh, entries if you're, um, if, if you're just writing there directly. The idea is that at some point there will be a notification via WebSockets um, so that you know, okay, other people are working on the same table. And at some point we also want to have actually users. As you saw, there was no login or no user model. So only use this project in your, in your intranet for now. But um, at some point when there's users, we, will, um, we should probably uh, fill the username into the uh, data line. And the, the changed, uh, when, when changed, that is a, a nice automatic feature by the database. So I don't even have to do much uh, and uh, can only always know when was the last change of each item. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's more tracking than, yeah. Has anybody got a question? Or two? 
So do you guys use this a lot for for you doing modular wooden? Um, I don't know what they're called, but modular buildings are you? Where you deliver whole walls? Yeah, we have different we have different um, branches. So uh, ones where we do like hybrid. So you have a, a regular concrete slab, and you just putting um, wood facade in the front. But um, where it really shines, I think, is exactly what you mentioned, where we have modular construction. Um, these are usually a little more expensive, but they have huge benefits in that, that they can be set up super fast because we can pr produce them basically indoors and then bring them at construction site and just basically connect them. And then you're, you're, this, is, this is really amazing when you, when you see how, how quickly they can go with that. Yeah. Yeah, for that, yeah. it's really helpful, yeah. And, and so, what does what does IFC Connector bring to that whole game that you that you think that the software you were using before doesn't really give you? So um, it can help with different things. So one thing is um, we have uh, different parties involved often in projects, right? Um, we have the the uh, wood constructing engineers which are working in in CAD work. We have either our planning team or some external architects who are working in all kinds of um, uh, software. So we get uh, internally, we use Revit, but externally we get uh, Revit, Nemechek, Archicad, like a bunch of, bunch of different uh, softwares. And then, yeah, um, they each map differently on, on IFC to, to say it very politely. And um, what we can do with IFC connector is uh, I open it with Blender BIM very often and just pull out the slimmest data set that I actually really need, like as shown with the grids. And um, I pull that out and uh, very often we just need um, a box uh, volume. So for, as I shown in the, in the, in the uh, meetup 13, we often think about like uh, walls, for example, like just as the bounding boxes and um, they are the bounding boxes of the windows that sit in them. But um, then we just need a, uh, a data point uh, telling which wall type that is or which window type that is. Um, but we can very simply and easily describe these boxes and we can handle updating also very, very easily. If, um, if there is a, if there's, um, for example, Blender BIM, uh, we could put that in the pipeline. And then every two weeks when we get an update from the architect, if there's an established way of what data we want to grab from their IFC, um, we can just pull updates from these boxes very quickly and easily. And then we don't need to um, uh, import always the whole model, which is, which is slower. And um, we see a very small and precise um, uh, uh, subsection of the model. That's that's I think what we what we see there. That's that's one benefit. And then the other benefit is um, that data can be um, uh, um, mo modified. Like with this multi tool, you can it basically doesn't matter anymore more how many entries of, of something you have. You can just say, oh, all of these I want to change with that. And um, so that helped with, with um, mass editing of, for example, room parameters. Uh, so that's that's basically the two two fields where I see it. Because mm -hmm. you also do design build, I understand. Is it right? So we have uh, in house also people that are um, basically doing architect architect's job, but also we have external architects. So um, for me, the the IFC connector is a kind of a like a central hub, and then uh, usually I would put just the minimum data that I need, um, and then I can. Uh, Recreate stuff in or uh, recreate this this content uh, in different applications, and that that can help. Because also sometimes maybe you don't want the data, right? Like if if a uh, if an architect gives you a building um, from Revit, then uh, he, he has no he or she has no choice to then to draw in feet and inches, and so that gives you um, uh, not the nicest coordinates. And since we want to put it onto our machinery to have it. Um, milled and glued, like there's, there's a lot of advanced um, fabrication machinery going on in, in our um, factory. Um, there you usually rely on very clean um, uh, um, coordinates. So so that that is also a point that uh, wherever um, 
uh, IFC connector can be the stage in the middle, uh, the, 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 the point, the man in the middle to, to maybe have a look at, uh, are these coordinates clean and maybe we need to clean up them. Yeah. Okay, cool. I'm just looking at the time now. If anybody has a question, I suggest you uh, bring it in now. Otherwise, where these discussions are very easy, take them over to the uh, OSR forum, and then OSARC and lots of other people would be very happy to to chat about what's going on. I have a question uh, yeah. from uh, regarding the software development, Frederick. Uh, yes. For the architecture, uh, you saw you had this uh, diagram for the architecture of uh, the project. Uh, there is uh, the database and there is uh, the fast API and then uh, what is there is something more there okay these are the services yeah so um, basically this is the server right and um, this is basically just describing okay this is this is the computer, like the, the Linux okay. server, right? This is the box. And then in the back, this is the MongoDB, it's just the database, um, which is running in a Docker container. So wherever you see this Docker is in the, is in the Docker container. So it is containerized, so you can uh, simply restart and um, also be very independent from what kind of Linux installation you have here because Docker is going to always look the same, so it should work on any machine. So that's the big advantage of these Docker images. Um, so when I want to run it on a on a um, remote server, I would um, uh, suggest going through the installation um, section, but it's basically um, a Docker Compose. So basically all these um, all this machinery here, so the, the, the database, and then the fast API, and yeah, possible other services. There's nothing here at the moment. Um, and then the, the traffic is the router. So it's like, like Nginx, just a, a, I think, nicer version even of uh, Nginx okay. uh, written in Go. So all this, this package here is run in one script. It's just saying, OK, uh, sudo docker compose, uh, docker compose yaml app build. And there's an example I provide in the repo. And you would just need to fill out um, some parameters that that are uh, related to your environment. So, for example, I cannot know which IP address the computer is on that you're gonna gonna run on. Um, so, when looking in the repo, there is the um, there's two examples basically. One when you have already a router, um, and one when you don't have a router. So the Docker Compose example is without the router, and the Docker Compose traffic has a router included. Um, that is traffic, and then you see this is just a YAML file saying, okay, we have different services. We have the traffic. This is basically um, uh, routing traffic um, from from the outside to the IFC connector. The IFC connector is down here. And the database is here, and then it's it's a uh, Docker Compose is this nice um, orchestration tool. You can put your whole um, um, yeah setup in this one file, and then you can also relate to to have, have relations between these. So, for example, uh, IFC connector depends on MongoDB, so it will always wait for the database to be finished starting up before it actually. Is starts because it makes no sense having IFC connector there and not being able to, to connect the MongoDB. But basically, this is the setup um, uh, I would suggest if you like, if you follow, for example, Jakob's um, instructions and put it on an I on a, on a little Raspberry Pi. Um, he has a, has this very detailed step-by-step -step inst uh, installation. And then you would just need to fill out a few things, um, which is one, okay, where where is the where is the path on your Linux machine where the database data should be stored? And where do you want to store the snapshots? Um, snapshots, oh, I actually didn't mention them. Maybe that's a quick uh, thing to note. Whenever you have a table, you can, of course, um, what you see here in the table, you can export as CSV. But um, what I like even better um, is when you configure your project, um, down here you have backups. And uh, let me see if I have one with uh, maybe already a couple of backups. 
um, probably here. Um, then it basically, yes. So you say, I want to create new snapshot and then it goes through all the, all the um, categories that this project has and creates CSVs and then you can just uh, open them and uh, diff them, for example, to see the, the changes that, that you had. But yeah, coming, coming back to your questions, you basically um, need to, uh, need to um, say, okay, where do I want to store the database and the snapshots? And uh, most important, uh, also very important, what is what is the IP of my Raspberry? I put that in here, and then you should be able to uh, run run it on your on your Raspberry Pi, for example. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Great. Nice. Look forward to seeing how that um, how that develops. You put a link. Let's have a look. Where's the best place for people to get hold of you? Is that on uh, the OSR forum or is there somewhere else? Yeah, probably the Matrix chat room or the or the OSR forum. Exactly, those those two places work work very well. And then, of course, also if if it's something regarding the IFC connector directly, you can also put it in the issues in the um, uh, in, in the repo. But the quickest is probably probably on on the OSR chat room. Yeah. I'm just putting the, um, the link to that. No, my browser doesn't seem to want to. All right, okay, cool. Well, thank you very much for presenting that. Thank you too. That, that's probably it for today. Enjoy whatever's left really? of your evening or wherever you, are in the, wherever you are in the world. Nice to have you here. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Thanks, bye. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you. Cheers.